Well, it's been a while, but finally welcome back to another episode of Stuff I Learned in the House of Bamboo. Have you ever thought about how mad sleep is? Pretty much a third of your existence you're going to spend unconscious. Maybe more if you're a drinker. Now it's okay. We have houses, beds, duvets. Oh, Cozy. that feels comfy. Thank you, Marjorie. Maybe even a heated mattress. A lot okay, to right now I'm feeling issue. it all over. Doesn't it feel great? It took a few seconds and it feels amazing now. Jesus. Someone get Marjorie a towel. But what about 300,000 years ago when we were living in caves? Or 5 million years ago when we were sleeping in trees? In fact, what about the past 700 million years? We've spent at least 230 million of those years unconscious. That's a lot of time considering everything's been trying to eat us. Sleep is a giant sacrifice. We're not eating, socializing, or protecting ourselves. Why does it happen? Most people know sleep is a time of restoration and healing. In our bodies, our metabolism is generating energy, but it's also generating damaging oxygen species. These can mess with our DNA, causing aging, making us infertile, and giving us cancer. Fun stuff. When we sleep, our metabolic rate drops, along with the oxygen radicals, and the restoration project can begin. More growth hormones are released, and our brains are topped up with glycogen. To be honest, I could probably end the video there. Next time some idiot comes up to you and says, Hey bro, sleep when you're dead. Look him dead in the eye and say, How would you like to suck my balls? But the story doesn't end there. Something amazing might happen in your brain during sleep that enables you to learn new information every single day. To tell the story, we're gonna to have to go back to an ancient neurotransmitter that has existed in nervous systems since nervous systems began. Pause for effect. Glutamate. Glutamate exists in every animal with a nervous system, from us to comb jellyfish. 90% of the 100 trillion synapses in your brain use glutamate to transmit signals. At these synapses, we're going to concentrate on two glutamate receptors, one called an um, AMPA receptor, and one called an N-methyl diaspartate, or NMDA receptor. The AMPA receptor works by getting a glutamate signal and letting in a little bit of sodium and potassium ions. When enough of these bad boys have entered the neuron, the NMDA receptor gets involved. These are blocked by magnesium ions, but when enough sodium and potassium ions enter the neuron, the positive charge causes them to pop out. Then calcium ions are like, woo, let's get this party started. And they start rushing through the NMDA receptors and boom, that's how a signal is passed. Congratulations, you've learned the first step about how you've learned the first step about how we learn. Learningception. Seeing as we made the humble decision to name ourselves Homo sapiens or wise man, it's clear we hold our capacity to learn in fairly high regard. In the late 19th century, neuroscientists were beginning to piece together the puzzle of how our brains learn. Santiago Ramón y Cajal proposed in 1894 that maybe memories were formed through the strengthening of connections between neurons. Then, in 1949, Donald Hebb introduced the Hebbian theory, suggesting neurons may grow new connections and undergo structural changes that enhance their ability to communicate. At this time, though, the technology to test this didn't exist. Fast forward to Oslo, 1966, a great year for English football. Terj Lomo is surrounded by rabbits. He's investigating a neural pathway in their brain by stimulating the presynaptic nerve and recording the response in the postsynaptic nerve. Then he discovered something groundbreaking. If a signal is passed multiple times between the two neurons, you could make the postsynaptic neuron more responsive to the presynaptic neuron. After this sequence of signals, a single signal produced a prolonged action potential in the postsynaptic neuron. The neurons had learned to be more responsive. Neurons that fire together, wire together. This process is known as long-term potentiation, and it's how you learn stuff. Let's go inside the brain of an organism that has to learn lots of stuff. A baby. This is the baby's language center. What it's going to have to do is speak a load of baby drivel until it begins to figure out what pathways produce useful sounds. Can you say, mama? Blah, 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 blah. Not quite. Mama. Jesus, have you been on the whiskey? Mama. Mama. Bingo. Now we praise the baby. Good baby. This pathway says the word mama, and every time it fires, the neurons get wired closer together. 
This happens because the postsynaptic neuron makes its glutamate receptors more responsive. It also adds more of them, and the presynaptic neuron learns to release more glutamate. To break this down, the axon endings shout louder, and the dendrites listen harder. Santiago was correct. So, the first step of learning something is glutamate release. The second step is the neurons wiring themselves closer together. For you to remember something five years down the line though, there needs to be a third step. This step is where Hebbian theory comes in. With repeated use, the neurons begin to physically alter, adding more dendrites and new axons in relevant areas. This is why practice is crucial to humans learning anything. A man who spends an hour a day juggling for a year will be better than a man who spends 12 hours a day for a week. As with most things in neuroscience though, there's two sides to every coin, and the opposite side to long-term potentiation is long-term depression. I wish I could say this is as simple as neurons that don't fire together don't wire together, but in reality it's far more complex and probably needs a video on its own. To put it in very simple terms, the synapses in the baby's brain that enabled it to say are more likely to be trimmed back than the ones that allowed it to say mama. And this brings us back to the magic of sleep and the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis. This proposes that whilst we're awake, long-term potentiation is occurring, strengthening millions of synapses. This net strengthening reaches a peak just before we sleep. Then, as we're unconscious, the total synaptic strength decreases, returning to a baseline just before we wake. So, why does this happen, and what's the evidence? As we're awake, we interact with the environment, acquiring new information, such as Mmm, frogs are delicious. This information is stored through long-term potentiation at relevant synapses, meaning that next time we see a frog, we're like Well, 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 I remember you being delicious. As more learning at different synapses occurs, it requires more energy and space, and if left unchecked would eventually reach a limit, where our brains are unable to store new information. This is obviously a problem. As we sleep, a strange phenomenon occurs. Slow waves of polarization pulse through our neurons. This is reflected in EEG brain scans as slow wave activity. Due to our neurons being better connected just before we sleep, these waves travel in a synchronized way throughout the brain. The brain scan would look like this. Regular wavelength with a high amplitude. The synaptic homeostasis hypothesis proposes these waves may cause downscaling at all synapses proportionately. Any weak synaptic connections are trimmed back completely. As the neural connections weaken, the synchronization and amplitude of the slow waves reduce. Eventually, synaptic strength is back to baseline, and we're ready to wake up and learn new information. So, finally, we might be able to answer why we risk being unconscious for a third of our life. Uninterrupted synaptic formation will cause our brain's ability to learn new information to grind to a halt. Sleep could be the price we pay for learning in the day, and an investment allowing us to learn tomorrow.